That's our desire this morning. That we would bless the Lord. That uh, we would sing out with everything that we have and praise His holy name. But it is also our uh, understanding that one of these days we will do that in, in all eternity. On that day when my strength is failing, still my soul will sing your praise unending. And we know that as we are singing His praises in this in this life, uh, that, that is our desire to be singing His praises in this life. And as we end this life, we begin our life up there with Him, continuing to sing His praises and bless the Lord with all that we have. We're going to have children's church from children ages three year old to kindergarten. and be just missed to my right and to your left immediately after the offering is received. So the sermon of mercy will bring our offertory prayer for us this morning. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and the blessings you give us. Lord, we want to pray for each and everything we do in this church and everything will be done according to please and to your will. Lord, just be with the leaders of the church, the pastors, the music directors, the pianists, the organ players. Lord, each one that has a part in seeing the things are taken care of. Lord, we just pray that you be blessed with this offering, that you might bless it to your work here in this community. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
keep on keeping on and to stay uh, stay the course. And so as you read 1 Thessalonians, you'll see that over and over and over again, that there's no really no real rebuke in the whole uh, the whole letter. It is encouragement to keep on keeping on. So I've entitled the lesson today, uh, Strict Commands for Excellence. Will you stand with me on the reading of God's Word? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 12. Word of God says, Now we ask you, brothers, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we exhort you, brothers, warn those who are irresponsible, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another. Excuse me. For one another. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the Spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Real quick before we pray, and we're all seated, I, I found out this morning, uh, Miss Donna Sparks was here, was making preparations for Children's Church, and she got a phone call that her son is in Oklahoma and is in ICU. Uh, it's, it's her oldest son and uh, has blood clots and they're not sure what's going on. She was very, uh, you know, very emotional about it. We prayed together and she took off to go do that. And so we want to pray for her oldest son. We also want to uh, we want to lift up Larry Thompson who had a motorcycle accident yesterday and multiple fractures. Uh, and one is very unstable. They will have to do surgery uh, on his laying flat on his back, not able to move, uh, not able to move his neck, not able to move around. So we're going to pray for uh, both of these. And also, I found out right before service uh, that Miss Sue Bradshaw, if you are a member of our church, you know uh, Sue and Bobby Bradshaw, uh, not able to come. And, and uh, she ran into one of our members. She said, just tell them thank you for all the prayers and hello. So we're going to remember Sue and Bobby uh, Bradshaw. There are many on our prayer list. And we obviously want to remember in prayer. But we want to lift these, these three families up uh, before, before I preach. Father, Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we pray that you would be with Miss Donna. She's traveling and uh, be with her son. Father, the situation there, I do not know the whole situation. But, Father, I know that you do. And so, Father, I place this uh, this young man in your hands. And, Father, we pray uh, travel safety there and back for family. Father, we also lift up Larry to you. And, Father, we pray that you work in his life. And, Father, we thank you uh, that it's not as bad as it could have been. Motorcycle accident off the side of a mountain could be much worse. And so, Father, we praise you for that. But, Father, we also pray that you would walk with me through these coming days, the surgery that he will have. And, uh, Father, we just pray your hand of protection, blessing, and, uh, and healing on him. And, uh, Father, we thank you for Sue and Bobby and for uh, Lord, their desire to be here even now. Father, we pray that you would continue to work in their lives. Father, we lift up everyone else that's on our prayer list. Father, it's an honor and privilege to be able to pray for them. We don't do it like we should. So, Father, we just confess that to you. And we just ask that you would move in their lives. Father, I pray that today, during this message, that you would move. Father, that we'd walk out of here and say that we've heard from you on high. Father, I pray as I've prayed all week, Father, forgive me for those things that I do that do not honor and please you. Father, I pray that you hide me behind your cross. Father, help us to hear your voice, not mine. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Strict commands for excellence. There are some things in the Christian life that we should do. Now, we live in a day of grace, and we're going to talk about a day of grace uh, before this message is over with. And if you come, if this is the first time you've ever heard me preach, you're going to hear a lot uh, about grace every time you hear me preach. Mercy and the kindness of the Lord toward us. And we're very grateful for that, but some have taken this approach that it's just sort of cheap grace and I can be forgiven and life just goes on. But there are some things that we are called to do differently because we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior than we did before. So we're going to talk about 
a few of those things. Point number one is this, recognize the leaders. Recognize the leaders. He says that there in verse 12 and 13. He says, we ask you, brothers, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. There are many things that, uh, that we do around the church that we, we laugh and joke and have a good time with, and I think that's very appropriate. If, if there's someone that can smile, it's the Christian who's saved by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And you'll probably hear something that you won't smile about, maybe, in this sermon. Sometimes my jokes kind of go flat. I don't know why. But, uh, but, you know, there's a time, there's an appropriate time for that. But I want to tell you, what we do as leaders in the church, and it doesn't matter who that leader is, but what we do as leaders in the church is very, very important. Very important. And, and, and the Bible says that, that, that I as a pastor will answer for what I do as a pastor at Westside First Baptist Church. The Bible also says that I will answer for the way that I lead you, the way that I correct you, the way that I rebuke when it's time to rebuke, the way that I encourage when it's time to encourage. And i got to be honest, I'd rather encourage than rebuke any day of the week. And I would hope that I'm better at that than I am rebuking because I believe that the church needs more encouragement than rebuke. But there's a time for that. We call it stepping on your toes, right? We call it stepping on your toes. When I was a kid growing up, I don't think some of the pastors that I was around, some preachers that I was around knew much about that encouragement. But boy, they knew a lot about rebuke. Because <laughs> they would flat step on your toes. And we need it. We need it. But when I stand before God, I'll answer for my leadership. By the way, when you stand before him, you'll answer for your fathership as well. I don't know if that's a word. If it's not, we just make it all right. Somebody added in the dictionary. We will. And so the Apostle Paul says, man, you need to recognize those who are leading you. You ought to recognize your Sunday school teacher every once in a while. Send them a thank you card. Go by and say, man, you did a good job. <coughs> you did a great job leading my, my child today. You did wonderful. Thank you so much. For what you do. We probably don't do that enough in our church to recognize those uh, who lead us and those who serve us in, in that way. He says to recognize them. Why? Because of what they do, because of their labor. The word labor literally means those who feel fatigue. It's because of their hard work. It's recognizing that what they do is not cheap, it's not easy, it's not. A lot of fun sometimes, and there's work that goes into it. You know, I know uh, when someone surrenders to preach, you know, if I'd have known what it was to be a pastor, I might not have surrendered to it, to be honest. But, but when I surrendered, I thought, man, that's going to be so fun. That's going to be so fun. I can remember working construction uh, on a job site much larger than this one here, but a lot like this one here. And, and, and I can remember working construction and thinking, Ward, if you could just, after I surrendered to preach, if you could just find me a place to serve in the church, it would be so much so much better. It'd just be fun. Everybody loves everybody in the church, Lord. And they love the preacher. They love the youth minister. They love the pastor. What are you laughing for? <laughs> I really felt that way. But you know, it's going to be so much fun. And I'll be able to spend so much time in the Word of God and, and have so much time then, Lord, to prepare my messages. And it's just going to be one. Y'all know I had more time then to prepare my messages than I do now. I had no clue what it meant to be and you, you know any job's a job once you get going you know I, I've read this that you know if you do your passion then your passion will never feel like a job that is a lie <laughs> that is not true any job you take after a while you'll have days it's work it's work it's a struggle to get up and go there sometimes I mean it just it is. I mean, let's just be honest. It is. It's work. And y'all, the hardest work I've ever done has been in the ministry. I've dug ditches. I, I've welded some of this red iron that's out here. And one day, I think it was last week, maybe a week before last, we were having a, just a busy day, meetings, and, and all, you know, stuff that goes along with, you know, keeping church going. And, and I was looking out the window and I thought, I wonder if he'd let me go out there and just weld for a few minutes. That looks like so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nobody bothering him. He's just out there with that hood down, just, just weld. 
And if anybody's familiar with Weldon, he stuck the stick five times before he lit the thing. And I thought, good night. Yeah. I can do that much better. <laughs> and wouldn't nobody bother me out there because you can't be right there around a guy who's well. I mean, you can talk to him, but he does. He has the choice to listen to you or to drown you out. And you really can't look at him while you talk to him either. So you don't know what he's doing. He's just well. Oh, boy, that looks like a lot of fun. I can remember doing it thinking I want to go to church because that looks like a lot of fun. Work is just work. And some days are easier than others. Some days, man, amen. You get to lead someone to Christ and witness and, and see a family come back together, marriage come back together. Man, those are great, great days. That absolutely is a good time to see that happen. But it's work to lead the church. I used to think it was bad to have one boss. You know, we had a if work construction, you know, you had your direct foreman that was over you, and then, then you had the guy right above, and then you had the job superintendent. You didn't want to see him come out to the job site. His job was to stay in that building. And if he came out of that building, there was a problem on the job site. You didn't want to see him. And really, to be honest, there wasn't many of us that really liked whoever he was, and it didn't really matter who he was. He was just a big boss. And I used to think having two or three bosses like that and I can remember when I first started and, and being an apprentice and a helper, and you know, you had you, you had the guy who was right with you. He was over the journey that was with you. And I can remember thinking how hard that was to have three, four, five guys in charge of you. Now I have 250 bosses every Sunday morning. I didn't realize that's the way that was. Y'all, I'm just kidding to a certain extent. To a certain extent. <laughs> If you're not familiar with how the Baptist church works, we can have a business meeting. Somebody make a motion. I fire the pastor. Somebody can second that motion. If there's no question of discussion and the eyes are in favor, then the pastor is leaving. That's how that works. That's a congregational-led church, which, by the way, I believe is biblical. And I believe that's the way we ought to be run. And I believe you ought to have the right to fire the pastor. Y'all ain't going to do that, are you? <laughs> y'all are, I just need a couple weeks notice, all right? <laughs> Listen, the lead the church is hard work. You're Sunday school teachers, but in a lot of time, to prepare the Sunday school lesson. Do. We do not have a Sunday school teacher in this church who doesn't spend much preparation. <coughs> Brother Paul spends hours and hours every week trying to figure out what song goes where and, and I don't know if y'all know this or not but Paul sings or plays through every song that we sing on Sunday mornings every week and he times it because he wants to be sure that his pastor has enough time to preach. <laughs> y'all that's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of work that goes into everything that happens around this church. You know I can remember just being a member you know and the lights were on, the doors were unlocked, and I never cared who did it. I really didn't. It wasn't a, wasn't a big issue. You just assume that all of that's going to be on because it always is. Right? Some of you got to do it. The Apostle Paul says, you all recognize people like that. You all think for what they do. But it's more than just to recognize, to be thankful for, but it's to recognize where God has placed them in and to revere that position. You know, there may be things, there may be times that you can't agree with me or the pastor of the church. That's okay. We have disagreements from time to time. But you still understand that whoever it is, it just happens to be my name by pastor right now, but whoever it is that is the pastor, you still recognize the position in the same way that we do the president. Even when we disagree with him, he's still the president, which why, is why it really aggravates me to hear of all these ball teams that win the Super Bowl or they win the, uh, the championship in basketball or baseball or whatever, and then they refuse to go shake the man's hand just because they disagree with him politically. It's still an office to be revered. And y'all, I'm not real political, but I'm just going to be up front. And if you don't like it, see somebody after service. <laughs> but Barack Obama, when he was president, he did some things that I disagreed with. In fact, did a lot of things I disagreed with. But if he came to Greer's Ferry, I would be honored to shake the man's hand because he was elected the president of the United States. Amen. By the way, the same could be said about Donald Trump. The same could be said about George W. Or his dad. It doesn't matter. They were elected president. 
Because they are. It's because of the position. You know, the Bible says in Romans 13 that those who are over us are placed there by the hand of God. And I believe that goes from the pastor to the Sunday school teacher to the president to the mayor. It goes for everyone who's in leadership. God, by his sovereign hand, has placed them there. We get a vote, but God gets the final vote. And so we should recognize the leaders. Now, my point number two, I got to tell you, I told my wife, I said, I'm trying to do, you know, R's and L's, you know, recognize the leaders, recognize the, and I said, the only thing I come up with is recognize the losers. She said, that's inappropriate. <laughs> Good call. I think it is too. I can't come up with another L. I came up with another L. All right. Recognize the leaders. Recognize the lowly. He says there in verse fourteen. He says, "Warn those who are irresponsible." He says, "We exhort you, brothers, to warn those who are irresponsible." What does that mean? It means that when we see people who are irresponsible in the Christian faith, and we all know who they are, don't point fingers. If you don't know one, you might be one. We know people who are irresponsible in the Christian walk. They're not disciplined in their walk with Christ. They're not in the Word of God every day. They just kind of float through life. He says that we are to warn them. We are to show them and tell them, man, you ought to read the Word of God. You ought to be in the Bible every single day of the week. And you have this issue in your life. You have this sin in your life. And that sin is going to move you away from God. That sin is going to move you away from who God wants you to be. And like a neon sign on a dark, dreary night, we are to shine the light of the love of Christ to warn those in the church who are irresponsible in their walk with Christ. And they walk among us, y'all. Let's be honest. We have been that person at some point in our life where we needed someone to warn us. I know I have. He says to warn those who are walking irresponsible, warn those who are not following the will and the word of God. The word warn means to reprove gently. Not to beat them over the head with the word of God. I've already told you when I grew up, that's pretty much what the preacher did. I came into church. I mean, he was a nice guy until he got up there. I don't know what happened. It's like he morphed. The sound of his voice changed. Everything changed about the man when he got up behind the pulpit. He didn't laugh anymore. He didn't tell jokes. He told all kinds of jokes. Y'all, the pastor that I had growing up, y'all, we were it was country church. Right? Not high city church like Greer's there. <laughs> it was a country church. So on Sunday night, this guy was like my third grandpa. We'd go spotlighting deer. Where's mine? I saw him. <laughs> we'd go spotlight deer on the way home. We didn't carry a gun. We didn't shoot, but we we used to spotlight them as we went home. I ran the light. <laughs> we, and then he gets up here and everything changes. He was like he morphs into a different guy. And sometimes I was on the second row going, yeah, he's going to come out here and get us, you know? It's like the little girl who, back before we had wireless microphones, saw the guy and he was mic and he was screaming, throw that wire around and he'd scream and he'd run over here to this side and scream and he'd Throw that wire around, and finally the little girl looks at her mother and says, Mama, if he gets loose, he going to hurt somebody? <laughs> John Wesley and a preacher friend, and, and, and the story, this is just how it's written, a preacher friend of plain habits were, were once invited to dinner where the host's daughter, who was noted for her beauty, had been profoundly impressed with what Wesley's preaching. During a pause in the meal, Wesley's friend took the young woman's hand and called attention to the sparkling rings she wore. What do you think of this, sir, for a Methodist hand? The girl turned crimson red. Wesley was very embarrassed by his friend's attitude. It was well known of that day that he had a great disdain for jewelry. Everything got quiet there on the dinner table. With a big smile, Wesley looked and said, well, the hand is very beautiful. Wesley's remark, as the story goes, cooled everything down. Kind of put a little hot water on his friend's little comment, too. The story goes on to say that Wesley was preaching a meeting in that night. 
young woman came, and as the young woman came, she came without jewelry on her hand. Now I want you to know I'm not against jewelry on your hand. That's not the point of that, that story. The point of that story is this. That instead of running around with a baseball bat trying to fix all the world's problems, if we would just worry about the things that are around us, the circle that we have around us, the circle of influence that each one of us has, and at times give a very gentle review for those things that are wrong, almost an encouraging statement, you'd be surprised what God would do with that, where you can't fix it by forcing it. God could fix it with a gentle. He not only says to gently rebuke, but he says to comfort the, the discouraged. He says, one, those who are irresponsible, and they may comfort the discouraged. You know, when you come in here, again, you, you hear a sermon, sometimes it's supposed to step all over your toes. I mean, it just, it is what it is. But you should also hear encouragement when you come in. We have times of great discouragement in our life. We have times where we question God, and is God... Is God really in charge of everything that's happening in my life? Or a, a time where you're moving from one job to the next. Maybe you lost a job through a layoff. And you need to have some encouragement because you are very discouraged when you come to this place. This place, Westside, and it, really every church that's doing the will of God, should be a church of great encouragement to those who are down. Absolutely. It should encourage you in your walk with Christ. He goes on to say, and help the weak. He says to warn those who are responsible, comfort the discouraged, but then help the weak. And you don't know this. You'll know this next month. But you'll notice when our line item of our budget that the benevolent line item is way overdrawn. You'll see that. Why? Because we want to help those who are in me. We want to help those who are in me. We try to stay within the budget. We try to stay within... The you know, that line at them, and we try to do, you know, kind of, but if somebody's hungry, we're going to feed them. If, if somebody's in need, we're going to meet the need, if at all possible. We very rarely turn anyone away or turn anyone down. Very rarely. It happens, but it's rare when it does take place. Help the weak. Now, this last line is hard. Be patient with everyone. The word everyone in the Greek is P-A-S. The whole or the entire son have patience with everyone. Husbands, that means your wife. Wives, that means your husband. Uh oh, he ain't preaching, he's battling now, right? <laughs> that means your children. You don't need to hear it, but your grandchildren. You have patience with them, right? If you knew grandchildren were so good, you'd have them first, right? Show patience. The idea is long suffering. In the men's Bible study, uh, just in the last week or so, we were studying on, on, on things that, that we struggle with, and one of the men there mentioned long-suffering. That's the actual word that he used, was long-suffering. Patience. We have trouble showing patience. Why? Because we're human. And it's a godly character trait. Long-suffering and being patient. I'm better than I used to be, but I'm certainly not where I want to be. So we recognize the leader, and we recognize... The lowly, but then we refuse to repay. Listen to verse 15. Listen to what verse 15 says. See to it that no one repays evil for evil, not to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Now, wait a minute. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 21 it says, You must show, you must not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. So, what do we do with that? Do we disdain the whole Old Testament? Say, well, that's out. That's out. We live in New Testament times. We don't even read the Old Testament. Obviously not. Obviously not. Because last Sunday night I preached from Jeremiah chapter 33. We're going to preach and teach from the Old Testament. It's very important for us to preach and teach from it because it is the Word of God. So if the Word of God says in Deuteronomy 19, 21, uh, an eye for an eye, uh, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, and a foot for a foot, then what is he saying here in verse 15 says, no one repays evil for evil because the word of God says that we have a right to repay eye for eye and, and tooth for tooth, foot for foot. All right. You want to live according to those standards? Let's live according to those standards. But God has that right too. Let's live according to that law. 
Let's start washing up before we come into His presence. Because you're going to have to go through days of ceremonial cleansing before you can enter into this place. As a matter of fact, we're going to have to find us a place in this building that we're going to have to make the Holy of Holies and no one can enter into that place other than the one that God calls out uh, of the Levitical tribe. The problem is, that won't be me because I don't have that in my background. You want to live according to the laws? Live according to the law. Let's get what we deserve. How about that? Y'all want to get what you deserve? Absolutely not. I don't want to get what I deserve. I want to live in what the Bible calls the day of grace. Why does it call it the day of grace? Because as John wrote in John 1.14, he said, The Word became flesh, took up residence among us, and we observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father. Listen, full of grace. You don't want to live under Deuteronomy, eye for an eye and tooth for You don't want to live that way. You want to live in what we live in now, which the Bible, the Word of God, calls the day of grace. Why is it called the day of grace? It's because of Jesus. It's because Christ came. And He rewrote what should be your history. He took your place. He died on a cruel cross that had your name on it, your sins on it. He took... Our sins placed it on His back. In church life, we call it the substitutionary death. He was our substitute on the cross. He died for our sins and He took our place. And so because He has, and because that's the only way we have to go to heaven, we'll never make it without Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except they go through Him. And because of that, you don't have the right to repay evil for evil. You don't have the right to repay evil for evil. You have the right to pursue what is good. You say, well, someone's done me wrong, so what should I do? Forgive them. Forgive them. Listen, and take full blame for the wrong. You say, are you kidding? They need, they owe me. Nobody owes you anything. You say, preacher, where do you get that from? Jesus. Jesus. We are, we're called Christians, right? The Bible says that we were first called Christians at Antioch. Before that, we are called followers of the way. Either way, we are to follow the footsteps of Jesus. If Jesus walked this way, I'm to walk this way. If He turned and did a roundabout, I'm to turn and do a roundabout and follow the footsteps of Jesus. I am to do as He did. And what did He do on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I'm telling you, your life would be so much better and so much less grief if you could just say, forgive me. Man, when somebody has done me wrong, I don't go to them and bring up everything they've done to me wrong. I go up to them and say, you know, I just want to know, I want you to know that I forgive the whole situation. And a matter of fact, some of that I'll take on myself because I've made mistakes. And sometimes that's not true. Sometimes that's not true. I have no problem forgiving people. Why? Because I realize, man, I've been forgiven. Do I forget the situation and blindly walk right back into it? No. No, but I don't hold anyone responsible for anything because Christ doesn't hold me responsible for what He should hold me responsible for. He shows me grace. <laughs> Who do you need to forget? Who do you need to just say, not going to repay evil for evil. I'm just going to do what's good. That word good means right. I'm going to do what's right in this situation. Now listen to what he goes on to say. He says, refuse to repay, but remember to live. And he tells us some things of, that we should remember to live for, and it's just little blunt statements. Moving on, rejoice always. Rejoice always. The word translated rejoice literally means to be of good cheer. When? Always. Always. We ought to be people who smile a lot. We ought to be people who are joyful a lot. Not necessarily happy, but joyful. You know, things happen in your life that make you unhappy, but nothing can take away your joy. Why? Because my name's written in heaven. When I go through junk in this life, and you will, when you go through junk in this life, remember, because He lives, I can face it all. Because He lives, 
All fear is gone. Because I know He holds my future. Life is worth the living just because He lives. Enjoy us always. He says to pray constantly. That means without ceasing. Talk to God. Worship Him. That word pray is more than just talking to God and listening to Him, but it means to worship Him, to walk with God every day of your life and, and do as Enoch did in the Old Testament. The Bible says he was and then he was not one, for he walked with God and God took him. God took him. And I hope that's how it will be on your day of bed. You are walking with God one day and God just takes you home. Pray constantly. Rejoice always. He says to give thanks. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You say everything, everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And this world's full of a lot of bad and ugly. Don't you agree? Give yeah, thanks. Give yeah, thanks. You remember what Job said? You remember what Job said? God took everything he had. God took his family. God took everything he had. Remember what Job said? Job said, Naked came I into this world, naked shall I leave. Though he slay me, blessed be the name of the Lord. You say, Preacher, I don't have it. Yes, you do. Yes, you do have that kind of faith. Because when you trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, He imputed, He imparted, He placed in you the third part of the Trinity, which is all of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul would say, we live from faith to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can thank Him for the not so good things in my life because I know they have rolled me. He says, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't stifle is the, the translated word here. Don't grieve the Spirit, but allow yourself to be a conduit for the Spirit of God. Everywhere I go, the Spirit of heaven working through me. Not grieving. How would we grieve the Holy Spirit? By telling the Holy Spirit no. When the Holy Spirit says witness, we say no. Not going to do that. When the Holy Spirit says, you know, you really need to spend a lot of time in prayer, but you don't understand, I'm busy, and I don't have time. Now, don't talk out loud to yourself like that. People think you're nuts. But you know on the inside we have those promptings, don't we? Happens in my life. Don't quit you. Don't stifle it. How else would I stifle or quench the Spirit? By not reading the Word of God. You see, if I don't know the Word of God for that day in my life, then I have quenched it, I have stifled it in my own life. Dozens of other illustrations of that. He says to test all things and hold on to the good. He says don't despise prophecies in verse 20. But test all things and hold on to what is good. What is a, what's a prophecy? <coughs> It could be a spoken revelation from God, but most of the time when Scripture mentions a prophecy, it's not a spoken revelation from God, but it's a written word of Scripture. And by the way, the Word of God is very authoritative. And here's what I mean by that. If the Word of God says, Thus saith the Lord, then thus saith the Lord. It doesn't feel right, but thus saith the Lord. I don't like what it said. It thus saith the Lord. It's authoritative. It has authority over my life. So whenever I view my life and I view how I live my life, then the Word of God is held in high esteem because if the Word of God says it, that says it. Then he says, stay away from me. <coughs> stay away from every kind of evil. King James Version says, abstain from the appearance of evil. And that's what the, the word kind here that's translated kind literally means. Literally means the appearance of or the shape of. So what that means is if it looks evil, get away from it. You say, well, now preacher, you mean every, every, every. You say, now preacher, what about, what about, uh, what about things we watch? You know, sometimes I watch things, you know, they're not, they're not great, but evil, get away from it. That means sometimes you may have to tell the, turn the television off. Sometimes you may have to get up in a movie theater, and this has happened to us, and, and walk out. It, it happens. You thought everything was fine, and then you get in there, and they're using the name of the Lord in vain, and I'm not going to sit there and listen to that. I'm not going to sit there and listen to someone defame the one who died for me. And you can't. 
That is your business. That is your right. But I'm telling you, based on what the Word of God says, it's a sin. You say, now preacher, that's pretty plain. That's just how I mean. By the way, that, that's the reason that I am a teetotaler. I don't drink a glass of wine from time to time. You say, preacher, can you prove it's a sin? The Bible says to abstain from anything that even has the appearance of sin. That means if someone around me might see my actions and view it as sin, I ought to stay away from it. I ought to care about what other people think. And so I do. I do. I don't use I, I don't use language that I shouldn't use. Why? Because it's appearance of evil. I'm not saying I don't make mistakes. I absolutely make mistakes. But I don't live in my mistakes. He says to abstain from it. He means get away from it. What happens if you've got something in your life? Right now, you it, you know, you just feel guilty. I mean, when you hear those words, it, 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 it brings guilt. What, what do you do with it? You run to the cross. You run to the cross and say, oh God, forgive me for that. I didn't see that as a big deal, but you brought it up in my heart right now. And you're showing me that I have an issue. And so God, forgive me for my sin. And you know, just let me say this. When you start talking about this kind of thing, you know, people get offended and all that, and angry. And that's okay. You can be offended and angry with me if you want to be, but it's really not me, it's God's Word. And here's the other way that sometimes it's reacted to in the church is kind of laughed off as cute, it's funny. Oh, preacher, he doesn't watch a movie. Oh, preacher, he doesn't drink a little bit. Oh, preacher, doesn't use that language. Oh, preacher, oh, preacher. When you stand, before a holy God, and you see Him face to face, there'll be no laughter. And the Word of God says that each person in this room and on planet Earth, right now, past, present, and future, will stand before Him. And I'm going to tell you, I've got a lot of things in my life that I don't want to see Him with. So here's what I do. I repent. I repent. In our Sunday school lesson, we're talking about David. King David, his sin with Bathsheba, how in his arrogance, he thought he had everything fixed and controlled. And when Nathan goes to him, tells him a story, he gets angry and says, we'll kill him, we'll find the man who did that. And Nathan looks at him, wants his finger in his face, and he says, David, you are the man. It's you. You know what David says? He doesn't get angry. He doesn't laugh at all. He doesn't even walk at all. He says, I have sinned before the Lord. And you know, sometimes, let's just be honest, when we read the Word of God, that shoe fits pretty good. And when it does, we just have to wear it. As I was preparing this message, and I'm telling you, verse 22, just as always, just been a verse, it's just it's a burden of mine. Abstain from the appearance. Stay away from the appearance of the evil. Preach. Stay away from that. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't watch that. Don't be a part of it. I've always had a, had a burden this since I was a kid. And as I read it this week, y'all can tell me about it, but I was convicted again about some things in my own life. So don't ever get the picture that I'm preaching down to you. No, we're both in the pew together here in the sermon. And we both have changes we need to make. I would encourage you, don't run from it, but embrace it. Run to it. And find forgiveness in it. And he ends the letter this way. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That may set you apart from a lost and dying world completely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless. Why? For the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. Who also will do it. Brothers pray for us also. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord. That this letter be read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with you. And he's done. So what's God doing with your heart? Some of you need to run to this altar and get in it and do business with God in invitation.
Some of you need to be seated where you are. When everyone else stands, you ought to be seated and you ought to be busy with God right there. God's deep. God's working. Man, don't run away from it. Run to it. Embrace it. And allow God to do His work. He will forgive you. Some of you need to be encouraged, man. Keep it up. Just keep it up. Some of you need to be saved. You walked in here without Christ. You don't have to walk out without Him. You can know Him today. You can place your faith in His faithfulness. He has saved you. I promise you. Amen. I don't know what God's going to do today, but I pray He has His way during the invitation. Whatever He's moving on your heart, you do it. Let's pray. Musicians are going to come. We're going to have a time of invitation. You need to come. You need to come. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this day. Father, thank you for your word and the truth of it. Father, I pray now through an invitation that you've moved. Father, I thank you for the study in 1 Thessalonians. I, I've never preached through this book before. Lord, it's been great encouragement for me in my own walk with you. Father, I pray that you'd use your word for your honor and glory in this place, this day. It's the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. You come.
listen for his voice. Listen, if you'd like more information about your relationship with Christ, then you walk out the door, grab me, I promise you. We'll open up the Word of God and you'll find truth there. Listen, kids, if you are the ones who are supposed to uh, be back there for Operation Christmas Child, y'all go ahead and make your way there. I forget that sometimes. And uh, people walking out without y'all there, so y'all go ahead and make your way there. Uh, if you have loose change in your pocket, you want to give it uh, what it does, it helps you post it. Operation Christmas Child in those shoe boxes. And uh, we do that every month. So you give as the Lord leads you to give. People are checking pockets right now. They're looking. <laughs> Listen, if you walk by and you don't put anything in their bucket, life will just go on. All right? Nobody will even know. So you give as you have. And as the Lord leads you to give. Come back tonight. Worship with us tonight at 6 o'clock. We would love to have you uh, here at Westside Games. Your guest will be at home. If you're going to be a part of the car show, please come back to the choir room. We are done. All right. All minds clear. Y'all ready to pray and go home? Amen. Everybody ready to eat? Good. I am too. Brother Colin, would you just miss us in the word prayer, please?